jump into things if, <laughs> if they're convinced to. And one of the ways is to do a play in the language is a big challenge because it's not only about acting anymore, it's about understanding something foreign. But when you go to anywhere in the world and you see a performance that moves you, it's, it wasn't the language that got you there, it was something about the message that was universal. So I was trying to adapt that here because this land base at one time, pre-contact, and that's another good setting for, for my work, <coughs> is pre-contact because then it doesn't, it just opens it up to even further possibilities. So legends and um, you know histories of, of heroes is, is great fodder because it hasn't all been explored in my region particularly. And the only reason why we had to keep writing these plays and you know talk to elders about our legendary beings and just stories is because um, a lot of scripts don't exist to produce for a Anishinaabek audience and there's a lot of fluent speakers here uh, right in Toronto who left the reserves years and years and years ago and enfranchisement or education or medical and then they raise the next generation. So I really feel like the language is here but it, it's, um, it's in pockets and when people started to find out just through word of mouth and the Moxon Telegraph and they were able to come and see and uh, when we were at the Robert Gill last year, they really understood the students because we had a daily dialogue coach and because we had um, several weeks were an opportunity for us to get it together. So it was uh, repetition at its you know finest form, but the kids um, really went through a process there that they had never even considered could be <laughs> a valid piece of native theater. But I, um, I felt like that is the essence of, of what native theater is to me. It is truly and completely the language because the whole heart of everything, who you are is in there. So I was trying to convince this to, you know, a, a fluent OG pre person, that's not very hard. Um, but to someone who had the language in their ear maybe when they were a baby, but never heard around the house for 20 years now, how could they possibly do this? And, you know, so the amount of weeping and um, realization of, of just the loss of that mother tongue was really amazing contrast for when, when I worked at the Bajimajig and brought 20 kids to Brooklyn Academy of Music and we put the play on there in Ojibwe and they didn't have any problem in rehearsal because they hear it every day although they're not speaking it every day. So the difference between the 10 year old cast member and the 20 year old here was just a real mind trip to experience and to watch and to track the journeys. And so the young people who just went to New York because they were, you know, we were allowed to and we had this opportunity and the funding and the kids in Brooklyn were um, not expecting a piece of Ojibwe theater and neither were the, um, the producers wanted us at the last minute to introduce some English so that they could understand better. But we had brought it down with a lot of very specific sounds and lighting cues and dance and the whole choreography and the whole bit, you just can't you know, rearrange it the night before so quick. So we suggested, why doesn't Esther Jocko come out and talk, talk to the audience in English and tell them about how her grandmother let her produce this play if only it was told in the language and if it was, then she could do it. So that was Luffy the Great White Wolf. And, um, and so she agreed and that was the agreement. So that was why we brought it there and so when the uh, the audience came in, they were all, you know, 2,000 kids, young people, mainly black audience of kids who were anywhere from 10 to 12. But after that experience of the one hour, we said to the producers, you know, let us just see how the kids react. And if they, you know, they can determine. Well, they were clapping, they were cheering, they were, they were cheering on the characters, they were cheering on the wolf as it got bigger, and they were stomping their feet. And at the end of the performance, they were just so into Loopy and, and the whole villagers, and they just completely understood everything. So we met with the producers after, and they knew that it was okay, you know, it's okay to have an Ojibwe piece of theater in downtown Brooklyn and have it be appreciated by kids, by children who just appreciated watching the story. 
So it's about how you uh, express, it's about how you move, it's about how you make things understood just by the very essence of making it theatrical and whatever those possibilities are. That's, for me, where I'm going still is, uh, is that route. You know, how did Jesus replace Nana Bush in the hearts and minds of my people? That's, that was a big question way back in the 90s, 89, I think it was. So, you know, that's still not answered in Wiki. But um, I've always wanted to turn the church into a theater because no one's going to it. Was, um, I just, so much has come out here, you know, and as sort of an audience of all of your works, I can speak, um, you know, I can't tell you why you keep doing it, <laughs> but I can tell you that, um, well, and I've told so, you before, Monique, that it has saved my life. It has saved my life um, and, and speaking to you Alanis about Gegua um, I've been, I am ashamed to say that I have been trying to get my language Adawa back for years a decade now more than a decade and you know stopping and starting a little course here at the Native Center a little you know, a few months here at the Native Women's Resource Center, summer at First Nations House, <coughs> trying so hard um, to get it back. I'm watching, you know, these students, some of whom I knew, and knowing that you had given, you, you and, you know, the team had given them this language in five weeks, and they were performing in it and hearing it did something to my body, went through my body, just sitting there. I saw a, a talk with Thompson Highway the other night, last week, and he was speaking of language, because it's the year of language at U of T. Now, um, he was speaking um, about three languages, English, French, and uh, his language, Cree, but speaking about it sort of in a, uh, you know, including all native languages, you know, in, in his, in, uh, in this linguistic group, and sort of performing it was a, a very wonderful talk because he was performing it through the body, speaking, speaking to us at times in French, in English, and in Cree, and talking not only about Jesus and Nana Bush and the collision of worldview and religion and how that has affected um, the body, the indigenous body, but then how language does that and where the language sits. English for him is neck up. The French for him was torso, belly language. And Cree was everything below the waist, visceral a visceral language connected to the land, which brings me into my next. And I, so I, I, could, I felt that maybe more than from learning it, although I've had my moments with my teachers when I've got something, but I felt it viscerally in watching Gekwa. Um, and incredible moments of excitement where I stopped breathing <laughs> um, but I do want um, the next question for our consideration is talking about language and land, which are so important, you know, to us. And obviously, the fight for culture is the fight for land, um, um, because they are inseparable, and lang you know, they're all intertwined. Hmm. Thank you.